So I don't know about you guys, but one of the worst things that I always find just insanely annoying, one of the bigger pet peeves, and again, I'll talk about this in a second, I do it myself, so again, I'm guilty of this as well, but it's having people who are like backseat drivers. I don't know how much this happens as often because of the fact that, again, COVID and, you know, we haven't really been carpooling as much, so maybe we haven't noticed it as frequently, but again, it's always troubling when you're driving along and you just hear somebody, whether your partner next to you or the person behind you is like, should probably change lanes now. It's, it's kind of getting close. Like, should probably move over a little bit. Or, well, if you want to get on that freeway, you, you better speed up. Otherwise, you're, you're going to miss that. You're going to have to catch the next entrance ramp. Or, well, you're, you're backing out wrong. If you're coming out, you need to turn more. Otherwise, you know, you're just going to have to go back into it. And statistics say, again, as I talked a while ago here, statistics say that the most common person to actually backseat drive you is your spouse. And like I said, I'm very much guilty of it. I often backseat drive Brittany probably more than I should. But again, again I'll admit my, my faults where I have them as well. But again, spouses tend to be one of the most common people who are guilty of backseat driving. But overall, again, it's something that annoys most Americans as a whole. They say, it in general, it's always within the top 20, if not at least top 20, of everyone's pet peeves. If you just start listing them out, everyone is going to have backseat driving telling you unsolicited advice when you oftentimes need it the least. Because most often when you're driving through, it's not that, that the backseat driver isn't giving you good advice. Most of the time, again, they're giving you stuff that whether you did it or not really doesn't make a difference. Right? That if I had made that lane change now or I waited a little bit, I still would have made the ramp that I was going towards. If, if I had decided to back out the way that I was doing, yeah, maybe I make like a five point turn, but I'm still gonna back out the way that I'm gonna make it. But ultimately, I think the reason why it bothers us so much is the fact that we already knew what we were trying to go through, right? Whether we did it their way or our way, we were going to get through it one way or the other. But the real question arises, what happens when we try to start backseat driving God? Right, what happens when we start trying to tell God, like, this is how you should be doing things. This is how you should be using your godliness. This is how you should be fulfilling the promises that you've given to me. So we continue in our series this morning, Father of a Nation. Where we, again, we've been looking through the book of Genesis, and we've entered into this section, and we're taking a deeper dive into the life of Abraham. And again, as he's currently known right now until next chapter, actually, just foreshadowing, he's still known as Abram. It's not until chapter 17 that we'll look at next time, where he finally makes that name transition to the all-known Abraham that we've kind of gotten to know him as. And again, we've been seeing his life unfold before us. And again, I've mentioned that he has his ups and downs. We've seen when he was up, when he first came to faith in God, right? That God told him to go and he went, he obeyed, not knowing who this God was because his father was a pagan worshiper and he most likely was a pagan worshiper as well. He sees this God who says, get up and go. And he just obeys. But then soon, quickly after, we see this dip that he has where there's this famine across the land. And I'll dig into this a little bit more again here in a second. And there's this famine and he decides, I don't trust God and his plans. I'm going to make my own and I flee to Egypt. I don't trust God to protect me. So I'm going to make my own plans of how I'm going to manipulate my wife and the Pharaoh and all these things. And he comes out needing God's help to save him ultimately, to, to maintain the promises that God has given to him, that Abraham almost broke himself. He needed God to save him out of that. And then more recently, in these last couple of weeks ago, we've seen how Abraham has been in this upswing where he defeated the four kings that had conquered much of the land around him. And ultimately, again, he saves his nephew Lot. He takes home all these treasures. And instead of being kind of bribed, being ransomed out, where the king of Sodom was like, hey, just give me back my people, but keep all the treasures. Abram was like, no, 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 I won't want any of this. I want all the glory to go to God. Everything that I have is because of what God gave me. No one can say that you or anyone else gave me anything, any of the blessings except for God. Right? And then last week, we saw this continuation of his faith, where he questioned God, but he questioned God faithfully. Right? He was looking for his promises fulfilled, but he was asking God, not if you can do it. He wasn't asking God, like, how? He was asking God, really, just how are you going to make this happen? That I'm an old man now, and I'm still supposed to, to produce these children. That my wife has been barren her entire life, and I'm supposed to produce these children. Like, how is this supposed to happen? Right? He showed us that it's okay for us to ask questions. It's encouraged for us to ask questions, as long as, again, we have the right heart behind it, that we ask these questions in faith. And so now we enter into chapter 16, and we see another low swing that Abram has for us. 
We see kind of just what happens in the story between Abram, between Hagar, and between his wife, Sarai. So with that, let me dive into the passage. We're going to be in verses. We're going to go through the whole thing, ultimately. But we're going to start here in, in chapter 16, verse 1. Again, if you have them in your Bibles, your devices, I encourage you to pull them out. It's always good to have those to reference, to see where these are coming from. But again, for y'all's convenience, I also have them here on screen. So, verse 1. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And so again, just not going to take the whole, whole amount of time just going through each and every verse as much as I'd like to. Just laying out a little bit of background here, we see, again, the problem that's laid before us. In this one verse, we see the issue that this whole chapter is going to kind of take over. It introduces all of our characters that we need to be aware of and tells us everything we need to know about what's going to develop through this chapter. And so again, remember that God just gave Abram the covenant, right? He affirmed it with him. And more importantly, he didn't just give him the covenant. Again, remember, he gave him the covenant and told him that even if you don't hold to this covenant, I am walking through the covenant without you. I am making this covenant with you, regardless of how faithful or faithless that you are. Again, this promise that again God gave to Abram way back in chapter 12, that he told him that he would be the father of a great nation. And it's the name of our entire series that we've been going through. And at that time, again, Abram was already 75 years old. His wife, about 10 years different. She's about 65 years old. And here in chapter 16, we see it's been 10 years since chapter 12. We've gone through 10 years now where Abram, again, is still waiting to see. And so we read through verse 1 and we see that Sarai is impatient Again, just giving context to this, it's not that she's so impatient. It's been 10 years. It's not just some 5, 10 minutes or a couple days or a couple weeks, whatever. It's been 10 years. Most of us, we get impatient when we're waiting for our food at a fast food joint, more or less. Imagine waiting 10 years for a promise that you've been given by God. Right? That's where Sarai is at, and that's where she is acting upon. She's been waiting for this promise, and she doesn't see it fulfilled. And we see this other background kind of laid out for us of Hagar, this Egyptian servant. Again, I mentioned this when we first went through this, way back at the end of chapter 12. But when Abram, again, had this lack of faith, and he fled the promised land that God had brought him to, and he went down to Egypt because he felt that that was the best place where he would survive. He told this lie to everyone. That this Sarai isn't my wife, but this is my sister. And in lying about that, Pharaoh catches wind of her and her beauty. And he says, I want Sarai to be my wife. And so he takes her as his wife. And in paying of the dowry, he gives into Abram. He gives him gold. He gives him animals. And he gives him servants. Most likely, again, this is where Hagar came from. That in the disobedience of Abram, we see this speck, we see this foreshadowing of the consequences that he's going to have here. That he has a moment to redeem himself from that, and we see that ultimately, again, I'm kind of, I guess, giving a spoiler warning, that he, he doesn't. He has this opportunity to redeem himself from the actions of Egypt, and he dives in deeper instead. And so with that, let me read through, chapter, again, still in the same chapter, verses 2 through 6. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked, on, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. So in this next section here, we, can, we see what happens when Sarai starts to get to backseat drive for God. Right? She starts trying to fulfill God's promises for him. And ultimately, we, also, we see how Abram responds and how he listens to others instead of listening ultimately to God. All right, Sarai comes to Abram and she starts unveiling this plan to him. Right? Since God hasn't given me any kids, it's been 10 years since this promise was given to you. Let's do things my way. Let's help God fulfill his promise to you. 
So he says, so she says to him, take my servant, Hagar, and let her be the person who my children are delivered to. And just to kind of qualify this, this would have been a fairly common practice culturally. Right? If the, the woman of the household was not able to conceive, it would not be uncommon for her to select one of her servants for her husband to conceive through. And again, if you think of it this way, if, if the woman owns the slave and the slave has kids, those slaves still belong to the woman. So that's how they would have seen these. These are technically my children. Right? This isn't my slave's children. These are my children because I own all the things below them. And so in verse 3, we see that Abram decides to listen to Sarai. Right? That he has this opportunity where he can turn faithfully to see what God has offered, but instead he listens to Sarai. And so I think the lesson clearly here is, husbands, don't listen to your wives. I'm totally joking. Please don't get rid of me. Just, clearly that's not what we're supposed to learn here, right? What we're supposed to see is that we don't listen to anyone who says something contrary to what God has given to us. Right? This is the same response we see all the way in Acts. That when Peter and the disciples are challenged, they've been preaching the gospel. And the Pharisees and the high priests, all the Jewish leaders, they come over and they capture them and they are put on trial. And they say, you shall not preach this message anymore. Peter turns to them and he says, we obey God more than we obey man. Right, that's the lesson that we take as we see all the way back here. That same thought process occurs for us here. That regardless of what anyone else says, whether it be a pastor or somebody in a similar role to myself, teaching you a gospel of something else, you don't listen to that. You don't follow after that. You don't chase after that. Whether it be a husband misleading his wife or a wife misleading her husband or any combination of people in between, if somebody pulls you away from what God has instilled before us and what his holy word has laid before us and what his Holy Spirit convicts us towards, you don't follow after that person. God is our ultimate authority and that is where our loyalty lies. And so that's the lesson that we pull from here, here in just verse 3 alone. We see how... Abram fails to listen to God, and instead he listens to Sarai, his wife, instead. And then in verse 4, he continues. And Abram listened to Sarai, and he takes Hagar to be his wife, and she becomes pregnant. And very quickly, we see Hagar now looking down upon. We see with contempt is the word that they use. Most likely, again, everyone in the entire land would have known. Abram worships God. And God has promised to Abram children. And everybody would have known this to be fact. And everybody would have known that so far in this entire time, Sarai has lacked to produce this children that Abram has been promised. And so when Hagar comes in and very quickly has a child, yeah, she just immediately looks with contempt. Because in this time, it still would have been known, and it still would have been the common belief, that God blesses you through children. That if you were able to conceive many children, that would have been a sign that God has shown his favor upon you. And so with Sarai lacking this ability to have children, and Hagar coming in and immediately bearing children, she now looks at her mistress, she looks at her owner, and she shows contempt. I am a wife that is better than you. I'm a wife that is greater than you. And so again, Hagar now starts to suffer the consequences of what she's done. Right, that Sarai is upset. But what's crazy enough is that she's upset with Abram. Right? We read that she comes in verse 5 and she says, Abram, you took my servant that I gave you when you slept with her and she has borne children and now she looks on me with contempt. Oh, what's crazy enough, she pulls the Lord into this. She says, let the Lord deal between you and I. And I think this is so easy to see, her blame shifting from, from taking a, the, just the position of like, oh, this is a decision that I made, and she shifts it onto Abram instead. And while we completely see that to be the case, that she is definitely at fault in some way, shapes, and form, ultimately, again, Abram is the one who's at fault here. Because Abram is the one who could have easily said, no. Like, I hear the plan that you've committed to, and I say, no. And again, this headship, this continual de de degree that we see, this goes all the way back to Genesis in the very beginning. When Adam, again, listened to his wife and he disobeyed God, he was the one who could have told Eve, no. He was the one who was given the command. Abram is the one who was given the promise. He knew better than she did. 
in both of these situations, whether it be Adam or it be Abram, both of these people heard specifically from God. And both of them had the authority to say no, and both of them failed to do so. And that's why the original sin lies with Adam, and that's why the fault, even now, in the plans that Sarai has made, lies with Abram. And that consistency continues. In in verse 6, Abram tells Sarai that Hagar is your servant. Like You do with her whatever it is that you want. Yeah, this is the same thing again that Adam said. No, 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 God, this is, this is your woman. You gave her to me. Right? You see the same deflecting of blame come across. And so here in this story, we see now that Sarai deals harshly with Hagar. So harsh that at this point, Hagar decides that she needs to flee. She needs to run away. I can't even imagine what kind of harm, what kind of things that Sarai must have been doing to Hagar in order for a woman who was pregnant to feel, I have a better shot of fleeing from this place, of running away on my own, than staying here under the ownership, under the, the leadership of Sarai. And again, this is what happens when we listen to others instead of listening to God. We start blaming others. We start shifting the blame to other people than ourselves. We start dividing ourselves. We start hurting those around us instead of being unified and listening to what the one true God has given to us. And so with that, let's see what's on the other side. Let's see what happens when we listen to God instead of listening to others. So in verse 7 through to the end, the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant to Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. And the angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for the multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael. Because the Lord has listened to your affection, afflictions. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Ber Lahal Ro. It lies between Kadesh and Beret. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So I think the last thing again that we see here in this section is what happens when we listen to God instead of listening to others. Again, in verse 7, we have this introduction of a new character. We have the angel of the Lord. And while we could spend way more time on this. Again, I don't have enough time with communion here in a little bit as well. We have the, the, the most probably unique situation happening in our Bible to date. This is the first time that the angel of the Lord makes his appearance. This is the first time that we have what's often called a theophany, where God appears before man. And again, some people argue that this is maybe just a messenger of God. But I tend to lean towards the theophany side. I think this is actually God. Because what we read in verse 10, that this angel makes promises, that says words, that says things that only God can say to people. That he promises to Hagar that she will have children that no one can count. That's not something that an angel can do. That is something that God promises to do. And so again, Hagar is here running away. She meets upon, she comes across this angel of the Lord. And the the angel of the Lord asks her, where have you come from and where are you going? And I think it's always so interesting whenever God asks questions of people. Because it's not like God doesn't know. God knew where she came from and she knew where she was probably going. She was probably trying to make her way back to Egypt. She was probably trying to make her way back home. But God doesn't ask us questions because he doesn't know the answer. He asks us questions typically to remind us of what we're doing or oftentimes to show what he has planned for us. And so again, Hagar says in verse 8 that she is running from her mistress, Sarai. And then in verse 9, God tells her, no, 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 no. Here's what you're actually going to do. You're going to go back to your mistress. You're going to go back to the person who is oppressing you. You're going to go back to the person who is abusing you. 
You're going to go back to her, and you are not only just going back to her, but you are going to submit to her. The angel tells Hagar that God will multiply her offspring, that this is the promise that I am making to you. You are not just going there empty-handed. You are not just going there without my divine providence over you. You are going there, and you will bear offspring more than the world over could count. And again, if you can't tell, if you didn't hear it, this is that similar promise that we hear made to Abram. Right? That Abram would have more kids than the dust of the earth. That Abram would have more kids than the stars in the sky. And the same promise is made here to Hagar. But not only that, she gets kind of what I'd like to call the most supernatural ultrasound we've ever seen. Right? She's told that you're going to have a son. And for the first time, God tells the name of a child before it's born. That you shall name this child Ishmael. And what a name to have, because Ishmael means to hear from God. That God has heard your afflictions. That God has heard the pain that you have gone through. And I have responded. I have heard and I'm responding to you. But nonetheless, Hagar understands what's happening. She sees what's going on, and she hears not only of the gender and of the name, but she hears what the personality of her baby is. And usually this would be something you'd be ecstatic to hear until she actually hears it. Right? That he is to be a wild donkey of a man. He's supposed to be a stubborn man, essentially. That every hand will be against him, just as his will be against theirs. That he will rule, but he will rule with authority and contempt rather than love. But nonetheless, again, at the end of the day, Hagar hears all that God has to say. And she responds and she knows that this is the God of seeing. This is the one true God who knows everything. So she obeys, she goes back to Sarai, and to his credit, we see Abram does listen and obey to God. Because he doesn't just name the child anything that he wants. He names the child what God commanded it to be named. That this child, this son that was born to them, was named Ishmael because God commanded it and Abram obeyed what God commanded. So with everything said and done, at the very end of this, what are the lessons that we're supposed to learn from here? What are we supposed to do with this story of Sarai and Hagar and Abram? I think what's amazing to see, first off, is how God acts through all of this. How God responds to what they've all been doing. Though when we look upon Hagar, she technically didn't do anything wrong. She was serving as she was supposed to be. She gets called to go sleep with, her hus with, with Sarai's husband, as she was told to do. And she conceives like she was told to do. And she gets persecuted and chased out of town, basically. And God responds, and he redeems her. He saves her. He goes after her, just like he does for each and every one of us today then maybe that's something that resonates with you today more specifically than others. That you feel like you've been persecuted. That you feel like you've been abandoned. That you feel like you're being torn apart from people all around you. And God comes to you and he speaks and he says that I love you. That I've sent my son to die on a cross for you. That I am here for you and I am chasing after you. That he has gone after you just as he has gone after Hagar. And so again, if that is you, if that's your story, if that's where you feel like you're struggling with and what you're dealing with, and again, God is here for you, and we'd love nothing more than just to dive deeper into what a relationship with God looks like, of what it means to be a follower of Christ, of what it means to have the promises of God given before you. And that's what's left for the rest of us, that if you've already put your faith in Christ, then it's understanding that we don't backseat drive the promises of God. We don't try to solve God's promises for ourselves. We listen to him, we yield to him, we humble ourselves, and we obey what he's given to us. So that begs the question, what are the promises that God has given to us? I think in looking through all the things that Christ has accomplished for us, the first one we look to is that God has promised us salvation. Right? That we are not ashamed of the gospel. That it is in the gospel of Jesus Christ that the power is there to save all of us. That God promised that whoever believes in his son would not perish, but in have eternal life. That I don't need to backseat God. I don't need to do more, to work harder, to serve more. That I don't need to worship God in something else. That there's no other thing 
that I can do other than to put my faith in Christ that saves me. That is a promise from God to each and every one of us. I think second is we can rest on his peace. That God has promised us peace. That when we take things to him in prayer. Again, when we question faithfully. When we pray faithfully. That there is nothing left for us to be anxious about. That he gives us a peace that goes beyond all understanding. Then again, ultimately, this doesn't mean that we never have any worries. This doesn't mean that we never have any issues. It doesn't mean that life doesn't throw us curveballs and that it's all rainbows and butterflies and sunshine from here on out. No, it's, it's knowing that when we take things that are pressing against us, it's when things happen in our lives that we know that God has a plan greater than the ones that we can understand. And the third one that I'll kind of dive into, and again, these are just three of many that we could look into. But the third promise that I think that Christ leaves us with is that Christ has promised to be with us. Or if we look at the very last command that God gave to us as a whole, what's known as the Great Commission, that we are to go and make disciples of all nations. That we are to go forth and make people that would worship and know the Lord God. And that we are to go forth and make people who would dive deeper in their affections for God. And as we go forth and we do these things that God has commanded us, he tells us that he is with us to the very end of the age. That there is no time that God would not be there for us and be there with us. That as followers of Christ, we have been called into action. To go forth and to create these disciples. To lead people to know Christ for the very first time. To commit their lives to following after Jesus that we have learned of and baptized ourselves with and baptized them in. And at the same time, we're to lead others to deepen their faith. To dedicating them to, to learn the things that Christ has taught us. To observe all the commands that God has given to us. And I know these are only three. I know that we went to them Fairly quickly in this case. But I want to make sure that again we end on time. That we go through things as we still have communion here in just a second. But I want you to kind of look through those. I'll put them back up actually. But look through those and see the promises that God has given to us. Reflect on those. That these are the promise that God has given. Not just to me as the pastor here. Not just to those who are part of the praise team. Or those who serve in whatever capacity. He gives this to each and every person who has put their faith in him. That Abram and Sarai heard the promises of God. They heard the promises that God gave them. And they felt like they needed to help God out. And for us today, my encouragement for us is to not backseat God. Is to not look at these things and think, how can I help God with these? That God needs to bring me peace. That God needs me in order for his gospel to spread. That God needs me in order for there to be peace. Now, I think the better way for us is to look through these and to see that, that we're just passengers in this car. Right? That we're, we're greater than that. We're not just people who are sitting in the car next to God. That we are, in fact, the driver of the car. That we are driving the car forward, but we recognize that it's God who gave us the car to begin with. That we are taking the gospel to our workplaces, to our schools, and get to our neighbors, to our families and friends, to the very ends of the earth. But it's recognizing that this gospel we bring is the one that was given to us by God. That it's God who gave us his son on the cross. That it's God who gave us this promise. And it's our joy to share it with those among us. And so I think that's what we leave off of this morning. I think that's what we end on and that's what we reflect on. Is recognizing these promises that God has given to us. And seeing how he's called us to be part of his plan. To be part of his promise. But ultimately again to submit to, to yield towards, and to love God in all that he does. Not to tell him what needs to be done, but ultimately again to hear what he's called us to and respond faithfully. And so again, I hope and I pray that you would do so in any way, shape, or form. Whether again to commit your life for the first time or again to commit it for the hundredth time. And just to see again where the Great Commission leads you to. To see what nation God sends you towards. To see what workplace God brings you into. To see what you can do within your schools. To see what you can do within your neighborhoods. That God would be known wherever it is that he has placed you in. And so let us see those promises fulfilled. And let us continue to devote our lives to bringing him glory. So with that, let me pray for us. And we'll continue to respond in song here this morning. Father, again, we thank you just for your promises. 
we thank you again that you are a good God. And that again, you do things in your sovereignty, in your plan, in your timing. And we pray, God, that as we continue and as we respond and as we go through this week, that you continue to allow us to submit our will to yours. That as hard as it is sometimes, that as much as we may desire this thing or that thing to happen, God, I hope and I pray that we can continue to say, not only just to the people around us, but ultimately to you, God, may your will be done. And so, Father, we pray that as we go through and we continue, that again, you would continue to provide us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us, that when we are too weak to respond that way, when we don't know how we could possibly give up the things that we have before us and seek after what it is that you want, that your Holy Spirit comes and helps us to overcome all temptation. And God, we pray that you would just continue to work within us and just continue to allow us to praise you for all that you are and all that you've done. So God, as we sing, as we respond, and let us continue just to give you the glory. We do these and pray these all in Jesus' name. Amen.